All right, very good. Good morning, everyone. All right, I get the privilege of uh, teaching this morning, the 9.30 uh, service, and I was telling Des, he was asking me, I was kind of going to name this Walk Worthy because it's going to be a teaching about that, but really the, if you just take the capital letters of should, and that's what you know this was going to be about because we should be doing these things in our walk, but uh, in a, a few weeks ago when during Des's teaching with uh, Titus, uh, you know, he was emphasizing that word should, and that kind of stuck in my mind and it kind of led, led to this... Uh, study and I'll share with you what I've studied it was more it's more for me than it is for anybody else but it, it was it's really good to put it together so uh, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4 Ephesians chapter 4 and before I get started you know I want to tell you you know at work I, I there's this uh, a retired pastor there he's uh, in his mid 90s full of his faculties. He's really a, a really good guy. And he's a retired Baptist preacher, by the way, but fully understands uh, the gospel. And uh, we had some great conversations between the guy. But and he's, his, we call him Dr. Ron because, uh, you know, of his past. But he, he just call, he'll just come by and say, I love you, brother, just like that, you know. And uh, so he has these, uh, I call them Dr. Ron-isms, you know, because he has these quirky saying so one of Dr. Ron-isms things was be who you is because if you ain't who you is then you is who you ain't okay so and we know who we is we're the body of Christ and if we ain't acting like the body of Christ then we're going to be acting like the world okay so I, I got a kick out of that, and I said, I'm going to use that, you know, and well, you know, be who you is, because if you ain't who you is, then you is who you ain't, okay? But anyway, Ephesians 4, chapter 4, verse 20, uh, it says, uh, we're going to read down to verse 24, but ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So you cannot, you cannot live by the truth if you have not learned the truth. Okay, most Christians today are in poor spiritual health because they neglect sound doctrine and they overemphasize application. Now, when I'm talking about application, I'm talking about our conduct. You know, it's uh, the scriptures. What's the scriptures call that? Our walk, and that's why we're going to be talking about walk worthy because you know the scriptures refer to our conduct as our walk. Um, True spiritual health and a, and a transformation in your walk can only happen when you're believing and understanding the sound doctrine. Truth is in Jesus, and his message today is a message of reconciliation, right? When you are renewed in the spirit of your mind, this is an inward transformation that goes beyond our outward behavior. This renewal goes beyond just changing your actions. Uh, it brings about good spiritual health when you change how you think and how you feel, how you relate to each other in the body of Christ, and how we relate to God. It's about living by the truth, not just following some rules and commands that you force upon yourself. Verse 24 says, to put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. The new man lives a life that's under grace, a life that's created in Christ's righteousness and Christ holiness. It's not created by our own self-righteousness, 
and or a, a mere adherence to some sort of rules that you're going to put on yourself. It is a transformative power of Christ and His grace. You have to be learning sound doctrine, or I should say, you should be learning sound doctrine, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and this will naturally lead to righteousness and Christ's holiness, because it flows from the inward and not from external pressure. Okay? A righteous life is not brought about by the external conformity, but it's brought about by the genuine transformation of God's grace. Now let's go to Ephesians 4.1. Now you can stay, put a mark in Ephesians 4 because we're going to be there quite often, okay? Ephesians 4.1 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. The Apostle Paul uses the word walk in his epistles as a very powerful metaphor for our Christian life. It's emphasizing not just our belief, but our daily activity and conduct that aligns with, our, with the sound doctrine that he's teaching. Paul uses the word walk 30 times. Hopefully I counted that right, but 30 times. This is referring to our manner of living and our, our Christian conduct. The word walk would imply a continuous forward-moving journey that requires effort, direction, and purpose. You know, when you go for a walk, right? You're going, you're progressing step by step, right? One foot in front of the other, right? So just like that, it's in our Christian walk involves steady spiritual progress. As you progress, you're growing in the faith, you're increasing in love and living out the sound doctrine that you learned and are trusting in. Paul urges us believers to walk worthy of our calling. We should be living to reflect the high calling that we have received in Christ Jesus. We should be living a life that honors our calling into the body of Christ and embodies the virtues and character fitting for those who understand sound doctrine. Let's look at a couple of the verses where Paul talks about walk, walking in Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians 2.10. Now we looked at this one here, Ephesians 4.1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called. But Ephesians 2.10, Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them as believers we are called into the good works that God has prepared and we should be living purposely according to God's design this we would be that in this way we're going to be reflecting our identity in Christ. Okay? Uh, let's look at Ephesians 4:17. Ephesians 4:17. Everybody there? This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Christians walk in the vanity of their mind. Here, the scriptures are going to contrast your walk with the worthless ways of the world, urging us to live with a renewed mind and a renewed purpose. Right? Look at Ephesians 5.2. Ephesians 5.2, which is the next chapter over. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. Savor. 
you know, walk in love. And what does the scriptures use as an example of walking in love? Christ sacrificed for you. Christ died for you. What, a, what kind of love? I mean, that, oh, what love. We sing that song, oh, what love. Drop down to verse 8. Ephesians 5, 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Here we're encouraged to walk as children of light. And as children of light, we should be walking in truth and holding to the truth and sound doctrine that we've learned from the Apostle Paul as our pattern. Look at, drop down to verse 15. Verse 15. See, that, see then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Here we're warned to walk wisely with careful consideration of our actions and decision-making. The Apostle Paul re repeats the use of this word across all of his letters, underscoring the importance of our active engagement in the faith. It should remind you that our life is not just a set of rules governing our beliefs but it is a new life given to us that requires our ongoing commitment to the truth and growth in the knowledge of the truth. Just by looking at those verses here in Ephesians about walk and our walk, you know, we come to learn a few things. You know, first, it says we walk worthy, right? We walk not as the other Gentiles walk, we walk in love, or we should be walking in love. Walk as children of light and walk circumspectly. When you put these verses together, you kind of find a nice little guide to our Christian walk. A walk that's purposeful, worthy, distinct, loving, enlightened, and wise. Look at Ephesians 2.1 for a minute. Ephesians 2.1. Now, the word walk implies a few things. So, it, now we look at Ephesians 2, 1, and it says, And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So I would think the word walk would imply living, right? Before you were quickened, or before you were made alive in Christ, you were essentially a dead man walking. But now you walk, your walk should reflect the new life of Christ. And this life should align with the doctrines put forth before you by the Holy Ghost, by the Holy Spirit, and not the old spiritual dead ways of this world. There's a connection between the use of the word walk and living. And it is, it's foundational, really, in Paul's uh, teaching. He's urging pe believers, he's urging us to live out our faith in every aspect of our life. Another thing that the, I think about the word walk, I think about like freedom and liberty. You're able to have free movement and liberty. Look at Romans 6.14. Romans 6.14. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Can, you can see that we've been liberated, right? From the oppressive rule of sin, we are liberated, we are made free. You're no longer bound by sin's dominion over you, but you're empowered to live a life pleasing to God. Drop down to verse 18. Verse 18. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Here the Apostle Paul highlights the transition from the bondage to sin 
to becoming servants of righteousness. Because sin once enslaved you, but now you have the liberty to walk in righteousness, reflecting your new identity and purpose in Christ. You know you're not you you know you're not under the law and you're under grace. You know that. We're no longer enslaved to sin. God's grace allows for a walk that is voluntary, joyful, it's purposeful, and it's rooted in God's grace. This empowers us, the body of Christ, to live out our faith with true liberty. Look at, look at Psalms 119. Psalms 119. And verse 105. You guys probably know this verse by heart. But the Psalms 119, verse 105. Everybody there? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So... We're thinking about walk here. You know, God's word is a source of illumination. It's going to provide clear guidance for our walk. Just as, you know, the street lamps and I'm walking down the sidewalk, I can see myself walking and, and uh, I can walk safely and I can avoid stumbling. The word of God lights up our path. And makes your, the believer steps much easier, ensuring that we walk safely in righteousness and in truth. Okay, back to Ephesians. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, 8. And we read this already, but we're going to read it again. Ephesians 5, 8. For ye were sometimes darkness... But now are ye light in the Lord, walk as children of light. You know, we were once in spiritual darkness, now we're children, we're now we're light in the Lord. We can live in a way that's transparent, righteous, and guided by the truth of God. When we walk as children of light, we're ensuring our safety from the dangers and deceptions that comes from the spiritual darkness that we once were in. It's, you know, I think about when you, you know, walk in, you know, it's dangerous to walk in the dark. You know, I remember when I was a kid, you know, you walk down the street, you never know a dog's going to come running out. You know, I grew up in Detroit, you never know when people drive by. You know, I was telling how I say, people are driving down the street and you see a car, the windows start to roll down. You know, you might want to dive by, next to a car or something. So you got you know it's dangerous to walk in the dark. If we are being guided by the light of God's word, our walk's going to be safe because it is grounded in the truth. God's word provides clear direction so we can navigate through the complexities of this life in this present evil world. Back to Ephesians 4:1. Ephesians 4:1. Everybody with me? Ephesians 4.1 I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. So you see Paul, he starts to pivot here uh, from the previous three chapters. You know, he was, you know he's uh, coming to a conclusion of all the doctrines he put forth in the, in the three chapters before that. And uh, so that's where he starts to pivot here, where it says, I therefore. So I want to I focus a little bit on that word beseech for a minute, you know, and uh, what that word beseech would mean, you know, in this context. Is, is, is the Apostle Paul commanding you to do anything? Is he, is he just asking you to do something? You know, when Paul uses the word beseech, it's like, fervently pleading with you. Des, you've got to believe me. That would be something we might say when we're beseeching somebody. We're like pleading like, you know, for them. You've got to believe me, right? That would be beseeching. 
It's, it's like a deeper than that, you know. It's a strong, compelling appeal to the members of the body of Christ. Those who are saved by grace, through faith alone in the finished work of Christ, to live out your faith. Paul's not commanding or demanding anything from you. The law commands, but grace beseeches you. Paul is urging believers, not under a threat of judgment, but out of love. He's encouraging you to live in a way that reflects your identity in Christ. Not because you have earned anything, but because you're already secured in it. Look at that word vocation. That doesn't mean vacation either. Vocation. You, know, you don't get saved and then take a vacation, right? That doesn't mean either. this is a vocation. It's a distinct calling in the body of Christ. This vocation is part of the mystery revealed to Paul, which was hidden in times past and includes the unity of all believers in the one body. Today, we are pleading with all believers, if they're really believers and have trusted in the finished work of the cross, everywhere to fully embrace the doctrines and principles of this present dispensation. We're pleading with everybody. We're beseeching them. Don't trap yourself under the instructions given to Israel and trap yourself under the law. Paul mentions three times that he is a prisoner in this epistle. This, this should remind us that our walk, our Christian walk, is, it's not without opposition. We're going to have opposition. We're going to face hardships in this world. But the Apostle Paul is our pattern, and he demonstrated walking worthy by his perseverance, his resilience, and unwavering faith in the face of adversity. Okay, Ephesians 4.1 again. Ephesians 4.1 I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. You know, I'm thinking about that word worthy right here. And that implies a standard. It, it, it's kind of like a measurement. Worthy, right? It also is going to speak to to the value you put on this vocation, the value you put on the calling. It is your commitment to follow what God is doing today. How much do you value that? Paul urges the believers to walk worthy, and he brings us up in a couple other verses as well. So I want to I take a look at those. So look at Colossians chapter 1, Colossians 1. We're going to look at uh, verses 9 and 10. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. Here Paul's expressing through a, his continuous prayer for them, right, that they would understand the importance of the will of God for the body of Christ. Especially in this dispensation of time, we have to know what that, the importance of that is. And that their understanding would be shaped by the mystery tr truths that were revealed to Paul. Walking worthy is not about adhering to the law, but living in response to God's grace. That's how we, we live in response. Uh, look at that, it says, unto all pleasing. 
I'm sure we all want to please the Lord, right? Everybody wants to please. I don't. Is there anybody here that does not want to please the Lord? If you want to please God today, you will not be trying to earn favor through your own works. You'll be living in a way that reflects your position in Christ. A life of faith, love, and obedience that naturally flows from understanding and embracing the principles of grace today. All right, let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 10, 10 through 12. Those three of you. Are, so, everybody there? Everybody okay? Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holy and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that ye walk worthy of God, who have called you unto his kingdom and glory. You know, first here Paul's reminding them about it. the Thessalonians, uh, you know, how his own conduct was and how they behaved. And how did they behave? Holy and justly and unblameably. So Paul is our pattern, and this should serve as an example of living under grace. He gives this fatherly guidance, as a father doth his children, according to the unique calling given to the body of Christ, and the mysteries revealed through Paul's My Gospel. Walking worthy of this calling involves living in light of our future hope and destiny in the heavenly places. Amen? All right. Ephesians 4.1. Ephesians 4.1 again. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Of course, that word vocation is referring to our calling and purpose. And this word, that, you know that this word is the, it can only be found in the King James Bible, by the way. This vocation isn't about a career path or some role in life. It is our divine purpose and identity bestowed upon us as the body of Christ. Think about that. Walk worthy of the vocation. Walk worthy of the vocation. All of us today, we've been called by the gospel, right? Everybody, you would agree with that? Look at 2 Thessalonians 2.14. 2 Thessalonians 2.14. Whereunto, everybody there? I'm hearing some pages turn. Whereunto he, he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul exhorts us to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, he's referring to our calling that comes through the gospel. And we can see our glorious future that awaits us who are in Christ. In, in chapter 1 of Ephesians, Paul mentions uh, the hope of his calling. Look at, look at Ephesians 1, 18. Ephesians 1, 18. Ephesians 1, 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his of the his inheritance in the saints. I would hope that you would agree with me that it's it's pretty important to know 
what is that hope of his calling, what that is, right? You'd agree that that's pretty important to know. I'll tell you, I have a, a confident expectation and have assurance of my future glory with Christ. Because God will fulfill, he's going to fulfill the promises he made to the body of Christ. My hope is that we all understand this glorious future that awaits us. It's not about just receiving eternal life. Amen. Thank God and glory to God we got eternal life. But it's, it's, it's also our glorification in Christ. We're going to be glorified with him. This should fuel your walk. When you talk about walking worthy, this should be the fuel behind your steps. The present sufferings are not worthy are wor not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That's in uh, Romans 8, 18. I probably didn't quote that exactly right, but that's Romans 8, 18. As we study the Word of God, we begin to fully appreciate the richness of this calling. And we will begin to understand the hope that we have, and this greatly is going to help us in our everyday walk, Right? According to the scriptures, this calling is a high calling. Look at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. For Philippians three fourteen. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. As the body of Christ, we need to be determined and focused on the eternal prize that awaits us. Our future of sharing in Christ's glory should give, that should give us the motivation and direction to walk worthy. Let us keep our eyes fixed on our blessed hope. This calling is also a holy calling. A holy calling. Look at 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 1 9. 2 Timothy 1 9. Well, you get dry up here, don't you? 2 Timothy 1 9. I think I heard Des one time saying, You're not supposed to drink from the pulpit or something like that, but that's okay. I'm sorry. 2 Timothy 1 9. who have saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So what does it mean to walk worthy of our vocation? It means we should live in a way that reflects the sound doctrine you've come to believe couple verses I want to look look in Titus chapter 2 Titus chapter 2 our, our life should reflect the sound doctrine which we believe Titus chapter 2 verse 1 but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine now drop down to verse 10 drop down to verse 10 not purloining, but show, uh, showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. So walking worthy would be about speaking sound doctrine. You know, in my, in my job, you know, sometimes I had to train some people in, in my career. Sometimes you tell them things, and you guys have probably heard this too, fake it till you make it, right? You've heard that? And, and sometimes that works in some things. But let me tell you, when you're walking in the truth, it, it ain't going to work. There ain't no faking it till you make it. All right? You need to be learning, and you need to be speaking sound doctrine. You can't be faking it. 
You will not have excuses for not knowing the truth. There is no excuses. You have it right here. Right? You cannot pretend to walk in the truth if you don't know the truth. Because what? The truth always comes out. Look at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Philippians 1, 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. One life should reflect the gospel of Christ. Or our life, I should say, should reflect the gospel of Christ. And take notice that we must stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, for what? The faith of the gospel. There's not multiple faiths. There is one faith. You must stand fast in the truth. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Philippians 2, 12. I'm going to read down to verse 16. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. trembling. Work out your... I mean, you've got to have it in you before it can come out of you. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Now I'm going to go back to Ephesians again, 4, 4, 1. We'll try to go a little bit further down in the first verse there a little bit now. Ephesians 4, 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lonely, lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Our high calling is a walk of humility, too. When I, you know, when I first got saved years ago, you know, I started to read the scriptures. I got a lot of, started to get some head knowledge. You know, you start getting a little bit arrogant, you know, because you start growing and you start learning some things. And you say, ah, I threw out this verse at some, you know, and you're like saying things, you know, hey, do you know about this? Uh, you know, and you're just kind of like showing off a little bit, you know. You get, you get puffed up as you learn some things, right? And even the scriptures tell us that. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 says, you don't have to go to that, but you can write it down. Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. So as I began to gain some spiritual knowledge of everything God has done for me, why, the, the word of God will humble you. It will humble you. God has done everything for me, and he's done everything for you by grace. In Christ Jesus, you quickly learn that knowledge without charity equals nothing. And charity, charity is love in the household of God. It's love in action in here. It's a love between brothers and sisters. You don't have charity in the world. Charity is right here. That's what charity is. It's love in here. 
how we interact with each other. And you ain't got charity, you got nothing. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, verse 2. First Corinthians thirteen two. So this is a chapter that talks about the gifts, but we're not going to be talking about that. We're going to talk about we're going to talk about what we should have as charity, right? And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Charity, without charity, that equals nothing. So, how should we as the member of, of the church, the body of Christ, treat each other? We're talking about our walk, so how should we treat each other? We should be humbly, ser humbly, humbly serving each other. Humbly. Look at Philippians 2. Verses 1 through 5. Philippians 2, 1 through 5. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lonely, lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That tells me we need to be unified. After all, we are interconnected, right? Our walk should be recognizing the value and the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what charity is. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. How should we, as the members of the body of Christ, treat each other? How about we, we shouldn't be provoking each other, right? 2 Corinthians 10.1 Now I, Paul, beseech, my, I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold, bold towards you, you know, provoking each other. You know, provoking will lead to discord and, and division. Instead, we should be aiming to build each other up. Paul did not use his authority or his influence to dominate or provoke anyone. But he wanted to gently correct them. Paul didn't want any unnecessary conflict, and neither should we. If we adopt this example, it's going to help us to preserve the unity of the, of the Spirit in the bond of peace. How should we, as members of the body of Christ, treat each other? How about with patience and long-suffering? Look at Colossians 1.11. Colossians 1.11. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Notice that it's God's strength that enables us to exhibit these qualities, right? It's not your own strength. Patience involves in enduring difficult circumstances and difficult people without becoming angered or frustrated. We have to give people the space to grow. 
And they're definitely going to make mistakes along the way. And they're going to change. Sometimes for the good, sometimes for the not for the good. Patience means you're not rushing to judgment or reacting harshly. Long-suffering involves bearing one another's weaknesses and failures in a loving and understanding manner. How should we, as the body of Christ, treat each other? How about we should be honest with each other? Right? Look at Romans 12, 17. Romans 12, 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. You know, honesty, it builds trust amongst us, right? If we're honest, we're going to build trust. And it's, it, it is essential for the unity of the church. Our walk should rise above the natural desire for retaliation and to respond in a way that's honorable and reflects the grace of Christ. How else are we to build unity and trust within the body of Christ? Got to be honest. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5.15. Well, time's starting to run a little short here. You just wave at me, Bruce, if you when I'm sorry? <laughs> All right, First uh, Thessalonians five fifteen. See that none render, render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Honesty, honesty is a key component of goodness. Sound doctrine motivates us to pursue goodness in our walk. The body of Christ should be seeking peace and promote, promoting harmony rather than seeking revenge. How I'm going to try to wrap this up here, I guess. How should we as members of the body of Christ uh, teach each other or treat each other? How about uh, our motive should be love? Right? Colossians 3 Verse 12, Colossians 3, verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. All right. Ephesians 4 3 says so we are back, we'll go to Ephesians 4 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You remember we read that, right? When love is our motive, these qualities naturally manifest in our interaction with our, each other. Without love, it's nearly impossible to consistently forbear and forgive. Never going to happen. Charity is like the glue that holds the body of Christ together. Way too often we can see that verse, it's kind of taken out of context amongst, uh, amongst uh, Christianity. And they want to start to promote unity with a big kumbaya moment, you know, even though we have big doctrinal differences. You know. Nowhere in Scripture will you see God asking us to form some interdenominational unity. But you will see that God wants us to recognize the unity He Himself has made us in Christ. And that we are supposed to endeavor to keep that in our walk. I think I'm going to stop right there.
Okay? All right. Hopefully that was a benefit to you. It was a great benefit to me. So let's have a word of prayer real quick. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity to come here and share this with the brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray it would be a benefit to all. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us. In his name we pray. Amen.